Welcome back, y'all. It's pewter time. Okay, cool, but what even is pewter? It's an alloy where tin is the bulk constituent, historically at least 75% by mass, but now it's usually 85% or higher. Historically, it was only alloyed with lead, but because of lead's toxicity or whatever, it was phased out and replaced with other, less poisonous metals, like antimony, especially, but also copper and bismuth. Others too, but who cares? Me, actually. The one I'll be making has zinc in it for some reason. I'm making pewter for the color, so I'm not going into the metallurgy of everything. For example, what effect the additives have on the properties of the resulting alloy. Pewter is so common that I won't go into what it's used for, but if you don't know, look it up. There are 14 or 15 types I'll be making, depending on how you define pewter. One is 83.5% by mass lead, so really, by modern standards, it's 14 types. Spoiler, I suck at this, I'm way out of my element, and lack the ideal equipment for what I'm doing. Here's a breakdown of the alloys I'll be making. I made an Excel spreadsheet so it automatically calculates the masses based on the desired end weight and mass percentages of the alloys. I used three sources for these percentages, Wikipedia for like half of them, and an 1854 and 1892 book for the rest. I think eight from Wikipedia, seven from the books. TECA stands for Typical European Casting Alloy. HML stands for Hayes Metals Linotype. I included HML for fun, really, as it's not really pewter by definition, like I said. Look into Linotype machines and or hot metal typesetting if you're interested in the history of printing, as it was the main process used from the late 1800s to about the 1950s when photo typesetting was developed. Then digital typesetting took over in the 1980s and is what is used today. One odd note is that in the late 1800s, and before that really, a max of 18 parts of lead to 82 parts of tin was the commonly accepted limit of lead used in any sort of pewter vessel that touches food and drink. At or below this limit, apparently no lead leaches out. Today, we know this isn't quite the case, but oh well. So, what were these alloys used for? I don't know precisely for all of them. I'm sure they have a lot more uses than what I'm about to say. The lay alloys were used for wine measures and ink stands. The plate alloys were used for plates, teapots, and other dishes. Triple, or trifle, depending on the source you're reading, are used for pint and quart measures, or minor articles, syringes, and toys. Britannia metal was used as the base for metal for silverware, and until 2016 to make the solid core of the Oscar statuettes, which were plated with gold. I don't know if they still are, but they were then. Since 2016, they switched to a bronze core. HML was, of course, used for typesetting. Queen's Metal's composition was initially kept secret and used for items made for the English royal family. Common, Asian, and English pewters were probably a default alloy used for whatever was to be made of pewter. Asian, I don't know what part of Asia, but that's just what it's called. I don't know. Best pewter was probably used for higher performance stuff. I think antimony increases the hardness of pewter, because tin's fairly soft by itself. TECA was used for whatever was to be casted of pewter. Who knows, man? I could be wrong for some, of course. Specificity is lacking in what some of the different types of pewter were used for historically because of how widely used of a material it was. Here are the raw materials. On the right, I have tin, lead, antimony, copper, bismuth, and zinc. The copper powder is from the Copper One Oxide video from the first run that I screwed up by using glucose instead of sucrose. The lead is the same as what I used in my potassium and sodium nitrite videos made from the ingots by melting, pouring into water in thin streams, and chopping the resulting slivers with wire cutters. I've had this granulated zinc for so long that I forget where it's from. The tin, bismuth, and antimony are all from Rotometals, or I think Metal Shipper. I'll put a link to their shop in the description. I weighed out all the calculated amounts necessary within 0.05 grams for the bulk constituents and within 0.02 grams for all the minor constituents. But I really tried to get it exactly as much as possible, and then I put them into paper cups that were labeled with whatever the respective alloy is. So weighing all this out beforehand was not very smart in retrospect. As I didn't realize how poorly suited copper powder is for making alloys when I made them the way I ended up making them. 
I thought the copper would just settle to the bottom and blasting it with torches wouldn't blow it everywhere, but I was wrong. For a few of the ones I remake, I use some very small copper shot and it works perfectly, except for one of them. But I have a reason for that that I'll explain later. It also would have been better to melt the tin first, then add the alloying metals to both lessen the heat required for melting and to get better mixing more quickly. Again, out of my element. I don't know if I'll ever do this again, but if I did, that's what I would do. So the melting points of the starting materials, tin, bismuth, lead, zinc, antimony, and copper are right there. And then this is the initial setup, a bunch of fire bricks set up into a makeshift furnace enclosure. I'm not sure what these fire bricks are rated to, as I got them from some dude on Craigslist like six years ago. But I do know they begin to vitrify around copper's melting point, which is a little under 1100 degrees Celsius. The cloth in the back is made of asbestos. For the first two alloys, lay 1 and lay 2, I use a nickel crucible. I didn't find much information on how readily nickel alloys with tin and or lead, if it does, and it did. So I figured I'd try it out. Porcelain crucibles didn't work. I cracked two of them. I'm annoyed. It's dumb. Whatever. Using the nickel crucible, you'll soon see that this was a mistake, as a few grams of both alloys are lost as the nickel absorbs some of the metals. After that, I realized I had to switch things up, but again, I lacked the proper equipment for this, so I used a graphite ingot mold as a crucible. Far from ideal. A cast iron, steel, or graphite crucible would be best for pewter melting. I didn't want to order one in weight, so I improvised. The ingot mold worked, but it took longer to get good mixing since it's rectangular and the ingots are thin. They're about four, maybe five millimeters thick. So once the metals were melted, or at least the low melting point ones were melted, I rocked the mold back and forth to get the best mixing possible as stirring something rectangular and thin doesn't work very well. I started off with my normal propane torches, then moved on to the same weed burner I used for Viridian in my last video. The first alloy was stuck in the nickel crucible, so I had to remelt it and pour it into the ingot mold. After the fourth alloy, so two in the nickel crucible and two in the graphite ingot mold, I realized that this setup was a bit inefficient, and I broke out my old beat-up furnace that I haven't used for years. The outer layer is a mix of cement and perlite. The inner layer is an octagonal form made of the same orange fire bricks that you saw earlier, and all of it is faced with a high-temperature furnace cement rated to about 1100 degrees, if I recall correctly. Obviously, it's worn down as hell and looks like shit. That's why I stopped using it. I started out by inverting a crucible and putting the ingot mold on top of it to protect the contents from the high-velocity torch but it didn't get enough direct heat, so I tipped the furnace over and used it in more of a forge style. Blasting it this way blew appreciable amounts of copper powder out of the mold, evidenced by the green flames seen at the start of each copper-containing melt. I didn't get this on camera because I was trying to avoid burning myself and dying and focusing on the task at hand. I remade four of the alloys, Lay 1, Plate 1, Common, and TECA, Teka, if you will. Britannia and Plate 2 have asterisks on the cups because the bars weighed less than 39.5 grams, one 39.1 and the other 39.4, but I forget which is which. I used up almost all of my tin, otherwise I would have redone those two as well. The rest of the bars weighed more than 39.5 grams, most of them 39.8 to 40, which I deemed sufficient. After all was said and done, I began cleaning up the bars. I clamped them in between two pieces of leather in my vise that I never bothered to properly bolt to the bench, and filed the surface that had a layer of oxidized impurities. I used a rough file first, then second, whatever this one's called, and lastly, sandpaper. I'm quite certain I used the files improperly, as I usually see people using them in one direction, not back and forth. I clearly didn't care, I was going for speedrunning this. After exposing the fresh surfaces, I cut the bars in half with a hacksaw, so I could get a look at the inside of them. This was to see just how homogenous the alloys were, and I think only two of them turned out poorly. HML was brittle, likely due to insufficient mixing. Common had free copper in it, but I kind of expected this. From what I read in preparation for this video, tin can only absorb about 1% of copper by mass when it's used to make pewter, and common pewter has 1.76% copper. 
Maybe tin can absorb more copper alone or with the other metals used in the common alloy or just in general, and I didn't heat it enough. I don't know. To make pewter into an oil paint, I can't just slather the bars with linseed oil and grind them against the palette and call it a day. To do so, I filed down a small amount of each bar, enough to get a good idea of what the colors of the metallic powders look like. I'm thinking I'll mold the metal powders with linseed oil and that should work. I'll end up with a metallic oil paint. The best idea I could think of is mixing the small amounts of each type of pewter powder, excluding HML, since it's not pewter technically, and maybe common since it didn't turn out to be homogenous, and making the oil paint out of the resulting combination of alloy powders. Filing just the small portions of each bar that you see was very time consuming, taking about three hours in total. There isn't one specific color that pewter is since its composition can vary so much, so I figure combining all the different kinds I made is the right way to do it. If you agree or disagree, let me know in the comments and say why if you feel the need to do so. For a furnace that I intend to build soon, likely for the Celadon part of this and just to have it in general, I have kaol wool, some like really high temperature fire bricks, I think they're rated to about 1500 degrees, and I forget what it's called directly, but it's for facing furnaces, whether they be kaol wool or fire bricks or whatever. But anyway, I'll work on that at some point. That's about all I've got. I'm open to suggestions of any kind as always. If you want to, like, comment, and or subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Next stop, Cerulean City.